Hi, this is Mark from LongIslandWatch.com and welcome to another episode of Watch and Learn. So the last video I did, I started talking about water resistance again. I mentioned it was going to be at least a couple of parts and I think I'm going to do it in three parts. I wasn't sure at the time. Uh, so the one I did was uh, how to get from atmospheres to feet, bars to meters, etc. But all those depth um, and pressure readings or markings on a watch dial mean. Uh, and then today I want to talk about different ways that you can measure water resistance or actually test water resistance, excuse me. And then the last one I'll do the third video um, will actually be a, a water test. And again, I'm not going to go over what different water resistance values mean. That was covered in, I think it's Watch and Learns number five and six. Um, check them both out. You'll certainly, hopefully, learn a lot from those two. But today I want to talk about testing because, you know, my watch says it's water resistant to, what does this one say, 100 meters? Um, this actually is 100 meters, so Yacht Master. I guess this is a wrist check, right? So the Yacht Master in blue and uh, uh, Seagull Chrono, which is only water resistant to like three atmospheres. Really very basic level water resistance. So how do they actually test this? Well, that's not as well defined. Um, there's two methods that are used to test for water resistance. Uh, a dry method, and a wet method. You could figure out, you know, one is without water and one is with water. Uh, the one without water, there's only like really one major test that's done. And then with water, there's a whole bunch of different tests that can be run. So I'm going to start and I'll discuss the one that is, it's considered the dry test. And this is probably the test that you know most watchmakers uh, will perform after they do a service on a watch to make sure it's still uh, water resistant. So the dry test, um, and if I can, you know, this video is going to be all talking, well, all the videos are talking, right? But uh, there's no watches to show you except for the wrist checks. I, uh, I'll try to throw up uh, photos when I can. Uh, so the dry test, basically, it is a piece of equipment. It fits on a bench, you know, uh, a desk, and it runs on compressed air. And you put the watch into a little tray, and a little indicator probe comes down and touches on the top surface of the watch and it's extremely extremely sensitive the indicator probe measures microns of deflection that's uh, millionths of a meter that's thousandths of a millimeter so it measures really really small increments uh, the cover of this equipment is sealed and then the the test can do one of two things it can it can pull pressure out or it can add pressure in so in the case where it pulls pressure out, it pulls out to whatever you set it at, you know, um, a third of an atmosphere or so, or four or five PSI. And as the air around, let's assume, let's assume that the watch is sealed, right? I'm going to use this as going to be my example. I assume the watch is sealed correctly, um, evacuating all the air around it or some of the air around it. The air inside the watch is going to want to expand the watch because there's greater pressure inside the watch. And believe it or not, the crystal will bow out very microscopically, but this probe will pick it up. It will pick up the amount that the crystal is actually starting to stick up and it'll hold the pressure for a while. And what happens is if the watch is well sealed, that probe will stay in one position. If the watch is leaking, then some of the air will um, rush out of it. It will come into equilibrium with its surroundings and the probe will move a little bit. And again, the probe is extremely, extremely sensitive and it will pick up if it's moved or not and therefore it'll measure a leak. Purge the system, start again. Probe comes down, seal it up, and now we start to increase the pressure inside. Now the largest I've seen these machines go to is, um, I believe, 100 meters of water resistance. That's 10 atmospheres. So it fills up with loads and loads of air. Uh, 10 atmospheres is what, 140 PSI. And now, uh, contrary to before, the crystal will start to deflect in. You know, it's all this pressure is pushing on the watch. There's one atmosphere of pressure inside the watch when it was sealed. And now we've got 10 atmospheres or three atmospheres, whatever we're testing, is pushing on it, on all around it. And the crystal will actually deflect in. Again, you probably wouldn't see this if you could actually see it, but it's in a sealed, it's in a sealed, uh, a sealed test case. Um, if you could, if you could see it microscopically, you would see the crystal deflecting. The indicator probe again, it picks up on this. It measures as the crystal goes down. You hold the pressure for a couple of minutes, 
and the probe basically monitors. Is the probe starting to come back up or is the probe staying down? If the watch is water resistant, uh, if the watch is sealed up to that specified pressure, then it will stay one atmosphere inside the watch. Uh, no air will get into it and the probe will not move. This is all basically called, they call it the deformation method. Um, which kind of makes sense. We're measuring the deformation of the watch and making sure that over time it doesn't change when pressure is applied. Uh, if there's a leak in the watch, air is gonna rush in and the crystal is gonna come back up to its normal position. And then that would be a failure. So that's how it works. You purge it, take the watch out, and now you're ready to go. So what are some of, uh, with each method I wanna discuss advantages and disadvantages. Well, advantages. Number one, biggest one, there's no water used. So if the watch had a leak, you'd find out, it would fail the test, and it would just say you have a leak. So, great. Uh, but there's no water, so we don't get any water in the movement, we don't get excess moisture, condensation, or whatever. That's great news. Uh, another plus, it fits on a bench, it's not a tremendous machine. Uh, cost, eh, it kind of expensive, but for a watchmaker that's used to buying Swiss tools, probably not the end of the world. The biggest drawbacks that I see to it it's water resistance, not air resistance. Uh, so when we put it in this chamber, we're measuring its resistance to air pressure, not water pressure. Big difference. Air is what mostly nitrogen and oxygen molecules floating around. And water, which when they use water in water tests, it's distilled water, not seawater, but still it's these little H2O Mickey Mouse molecules that are floating around. Very different, gonna go by seals very differently. So that's one of the biggest drawbacks is that it's not apples to apples. It's not apples to oranges either though. It's like green apples to red apples maybe. I mean, it's kind of the same, but not really. Uh, the other big disadvantage um, is that It'll only tell you if it's a failure. You cannot see where there is a failure. You will not know if it's the crystal gasket, the case back gasket, the crown gasket, maybe a pusher gasket, maybe helium escape valve, uh, anything that it might be. You won't know, you'll just know it failed and then you need to go to another method if you wanna to try to figure out where it's coming from or you can just go clean, lube, seal everything and, and try it again. Which brings us to the wet methods. So the wet methods, there's, I'm going to break it down into two categories. This is just what I call them. Um, I realize this over time that one method is like more of a witness method where you can see it and you find out what's going on. And then the, all, all the other methods are basically blind. Um, so that's the two categories of methodology. So the one I'm actually going to demonstrate, I think next, next watch and learn or whenever I get around to it is going to be the witness method. Uh, and then, so that is you have a canister. It's filled with distilled water. Again, we're not using seawater. They use seawater for many reasons. It corrodes the equipment. It obviously can corrode the watch. Um, so distilled water is allowed to be used even though it's not a fair and accurate representation of what the watch sees in actual use. It's still water. We'll, we're gonna let that one slide. Uh, so we have a vessel filled half with distilled water and by some means, either by a lever or a knob or air pressure, whatever, we pressurize the inside of this vessel to three atmospheres or whatever the pressure is gonna be. Usually they don't go much over three atmospheres. Um, the watch is already in there. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mention that the watch is already inside, right? And we pressurize it, the watch is suspended above the water. It's in the pressurized air. So now there's three atmospheres of pressure in the air, three atmospheres of pressure in the water. We wait three minutes, we, we're gonna let everything uh, come into equilibrium. If there was a hole in a gasket or a seal or something, we're letting the air permeate um, into the watch so that everything is in equilibrium if it can be. We are then submerging the watch, the watch case I should say, and we are instantaneously releasing the pressure. So what happens now? So let's say the watch was fully sealed. So the watch is at one atmosphere on the inside, the vessel is at three atmospheres, you put it in water, you release the pressure. The watch is still at one atmosphere. The vessel is at one atmosphere. The vessel instantaneously goes to one atmosphere. Nothing happens. No air bubbles, no nothing. You take it out. Happy days. You've passed the water pressure test. Let's say now it was a failure. So as you were pumping up the chamber full of air, air was going into the watch. So now the watch is at three atmospheres. The vessel is also contained in the same uh, three atmospheres of pressure. You dunk it in the water, you release the pressure. What happens? Immediately, the vessel comes to equilibrium with its surrounding, goes to one atmosphere really fast. Now the watch has three atmospheres of air in it, more higher pressure than the outside. So what's gonna happen? The air is going to want to leave the watch. 
Now, because it's probably in the form of a small flaw or defect, uh, somewhere in a crystal, in a gasket, or somewhere else, the air is going to come out slowly, and you will notice this as a trail of bubbles that go up. And I'm hoping I can demonstrate this uh, in the next video. So that's immediately a sign that there's a leak, the bubbles come out, we can look at it, we know where the leak is. This is the witness test now, we've now seen where the leak is. We quickly get the watch out of there, and then we can continue with our inspection. We can take it apart, we can see where the leak is. We do have to dry the watch out if the movement hand and dial were in it. Um, but you know now we can kind of figure out what's wrong with it, which is a really cool uh, which is what's really cool about the witness method. And you can do it in other ways. Um, I've seen it in ways where they submerge the watch and then they vacuum out the air with a vacuum machine. Whatever the case may be, it's all doing the same thing. It's lowering the pressure around the watch to get the case to kind of give up, give up the ghost. Tell us where the leak is, uh, if there is a leak, right? Uh, benefits this method. It's cheap. Uh, the equipment, even the highest quality Swiss equipment, it's like seven or eight hundred bucks at retail. So, you know, even the hobbyist can get one of these um, off of Amazon for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, it's not going to be the same quality, but, it, you know, it's inexpensive. Certainly, it fits on a bench, um, doesn't require electricity, nothing. Easy to use, uh, cool equipment. Uh, what's bad about it? Well, if you think about it, you're doing the, you're going backwards with water resistance. When you dive down 100 meters, 200 meters, whatever, whatever it may be, water is trying to get in. What you're doing with this test is you're trying to force air out. Again, not apples to apples. It's close. It's not apples and oranges again, but it's still not the same exact thing. You're, you're letting air out of the case. So it's an egress, not an ingress. And it's air, it's not water. The water is used merely as a witness for like finding a hole in a tire. It's the only reason water is there. We're not using water because we're trying to force water into the case. That already happened when it was above and we were pressurizing uh, the entire chamber. So that's the witness test, uh, pluses and minuses. Again, the biggest plus there is that you can see where your problem is. Uh, which brings us really to the last one. The last one now, this is reserved pretty much for manufacturers. This is what I call the blind test. I've never seen it referred to as the blind test, but it's pretty much what it is and it is exactly what you want it to be. You know, it's what you imagine when you think of a wristwatch testing. You know, if you wanted to take a, a test of watch, you would take it and throw it in an ocean 200 meters and see if it lives. Well, it's kind of what they do. So the equipment is very expensive, but it can hold one watch or it can hold dozens of watches or cases. Usually the bracelets aren't attached for this, right? Uh, that just takes up room. Uh, so we put it in distilled water. Oh wait, I gotta back up a second. So now, because we're gonna try to force water into the watch, generally they take out the movement, the dial, the hands, the whole assembly comes out, they reseal the watch. So it's an empty case, because if you have a failure at this level, and the case fills with water, and let's say you're Rolex, you're throwing out how much money on the inside of the watch if you have a failure. Now, maybe that failure rate's so low they don't worry about it, Again, I'm not a manufacturer, I don't know, but generally this test is done on empty watch cases, uh, which will lead me to the negative when I get to the end, or, or the drawback, if you will. Uh, so they take all these cases, sealed up, whether it's one or whether it's dozens, okay? Put it in water, and now they test it to, if it's dive watch, the ISO standards, they go 25% over the rated pressure, so if it's 200 meters, they pressurize it to 250 meters, hold it for whatever they're supposed to hold it for, I mean, it's two hours, whatever, bring it back down, purge the pressure, remove them. So now what do you do? How the hell do you know if there's water in these things? Well, they're pretty smart. They put them on a heated plate. It's heated to around 50 degrees centigrade, which is a little over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They let them get nice and toasty. It takes like 10 or 20 minutes. And then they can do one of two things. They can take room temp take it off the plate. They can take room temperature water and drop it on the surface, uh, 20, 25 degrees centigrade or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and wait a few seconds, wipe the water away, and if there's water in the case, it will condense on the underside of the crystal, uh, just from that little temperature change, kind of like uh, eyeglasses coming into an air-conditioned an air conditioned room on a, on a hot, humid day, or you bring a nice coffee outside, whatever, uh, the change in temperature will cause the whatever moisture is inside to instantaneously condense on the crystal and you'll see it as a, as a witness of condensation and water droplets. Um, the other thing that some places do is actually have cooled plates. So after the hot, 
they take it and they put it on a cooled plate, which is the same thing, it's just cold, and it does the same thing. Uh, and then they check it and they're looking for condensation under the crystal. Not to be confused with what I did in like watch and learn. Again, I always forget, I should look this up. Number five or six, I took the ice cube and I put it on the SKX and I showed you I can force condensation out of a completely you know, watertight watch. That is still true. Um, but that's the kind of condensation that disappears within seconds because you're just drawing whatever moisture is in the watch naturally to the surface and it just it goes back into equilibrium into its surroundings. Here we're looking for moisture that actually stays behind. So you've tested all your cases. If they failed, well, what the hell do you do? I, I guess you can go back to go to the witness test and try to figure out where the problem area is. That's pretty much one of the only things you can do, or you can just try to make it pass again. You can change the crystal, change the seals, change the back, whatever the case may be. Uh, so let's get into the pluses and minuses real quick. The biggest plus is this is a direct test of what the watch will see in use, except for using distilled water versus uh, the salinity of salt water. So it's really, really good. The biggest negative, it's expensive. It's really expensive. This equipment is tens of thousands of dollars if you want to get these huge setups. They're very specialized, not many companies that make stuff like this. Um, Another drawback is, like I said, it's blind, so you won't know if you fail, where you fail. And then one drawback that I alluded to that it definitely is worth mentioning. So you tested a case. It was empty. There's no watch in it. Well, what do you have to do now to sell this thing? You have to open the case, put the movement back in, put the crown in, seal it back up. So... You're not going to go run the test again, are you? I, I don't think so. I, I really don't know. So again, I'm not a manufacturer. I don't know. My guess is that, you know, through processes and procedures, ISO 9000, DIN certifications, whatever, that their processes are proven. And if you just remove the back, put the watch in and tighten it back down, you should be okay. Maybe they put it through another air check or an air test to make sure that, you know, everything is still uh, working out okay, but that's that's something I actually don't know the answer to again because I'm not a manufacturer. Um, I would be curious to know if anybody has a any thoughts on it. Maybe uh, I don't know. Put it down below if you know what happens after you test an empty case, um, because I'm pretty sure they don't test watches in this condition, fully loaded. Because well, in the, okay, let's say in the case of a Seiko, you know, I guess if if you lost a couple Seikos here or there, you, you really wouldn't care. They they are almost disposable. At the manufacturing level, at the manufacturing level, um, but a Rolex not exactly disposable. I don't think you'd want to throw those out. Although, or maybe they have a zero defect rate, and everything always works for them, so they test them fully loaded. I don't fully know the answer to that, um, uh, but I want to bring it out there and just bring it up as as a point that you know something is you know not exactly again apples and oranges in this case because we're testing it empty, then we're opening it up, resealing it and then declaring it to be water resistant. Anyway, um, I think that was it. Yeah, that was the last method, and I gave you the pluses, and I gave you the minuses. So I think that about wraps it up. This has been Mark from LongIslandWatch.com with Watch and Learn, talking to you a little bit about water resistance. Uh, again, we'll hopefully do a demonstration in the next video. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to the channel if you have not done so. If you have any questions or comments, put them down below. Actually, I hope to see questions and comments down below. Uh, and I'll be sure to address them and read them as soon as I can. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.